The following program has been pre recorded, so please don't call in at this time. If you wish to participate in the program, tune in at 5 p.m. every Wednesday for A Pause for Thought on Baton Rouge Community Radio. Good evening, fellow humans. This is Wayne Parker on a pause for thought here on Baton Rouge Community Radio 96.9 FM here in Baton Rouge. Well, my apologies for the volume on the uh, intro music, but anyway. Good evening. We're glad to have you here. Lang and I are glad to be here. Um, We're going to be discussing the upcoming November 6th elections here in Louisiana, particularly the six constitutional amendments and the one legislative act that will be on the ballot. Um, we'll, we're going to try to get through all of them as, and give an explanation anyway and maybe our opinions. Uh, but you can call in 343-9927 if you'd like to call in and contribute your own ideas or opinions on this, correct us or what have you. 343-9927. Give us a shout. Okay, Lang, like I said before, let me read right through. There are six state constitutional amendments proposed that we're going to be voting on this November. And then there's a statewide parish ballot for another thing. But Amendment 1 to the Constitution would prohibit felons from from qualifying for public office for five years after serving their sentence. Num, uh, Amendment 2 is to re- would require a unanimous jury verdict in all felony cases. Amendment 3 would allow political subdivisions like parish governments, city governments to exchange public equipment and personnel for authorized activities. Amendment 4 would prohibit the using money in the Transportation Trust Fund by state police for traffic control purposes. Amendment 5 would allow special assessments for certain homes held in trust and Amendment 6 would require a tax phase-in for primary homes when an assessment increases their value by more than 50%. And the statewide parish ballot um, asked the question, shall fantasy sports contests be permitted in the parish of your, you know, your parish, or should it be permitted? And I guess the, cont- the contest term is, you know, it's it's... Gambling. I guess they they want to know if, if we want to allow legal gambling on um, fantasy sports games and contests or whatever. Anyway, so Lang, um, we both. Well, I don't know about you. I looked at the um, Public Affairs Research Council of Louisiana or the PAR report on the uh, constitutional amendments or guide to the 2018 constitutional amendments. And Amendment Number One, they state here. Okay, a vote for it would be um, a vote for the amendment would constitutionally prohibit convicted non-pardoned felons from seeking or holding public office until five years after completion of a sentence. And they say here the current situation allows non-pardoned convicted felons to qualify for public office um, once they finish. Now I'm wrong there. It just says that when they're under an order of imprisonment, they cannot qualify for a public office, to run for a public office. And so once they're finished their sentence, apparently they're, they're right away they can qualify. However, in 1998, the legislature passed an amendment that would allow felons to qualify for public office um, Right after they finish their probation periods, but the way when the when the bill when that particular amendment was put on the ballot for the people, it stipulated that felons had to wait 15 years after completion of their sentence, and that got shot down, and hence we're at the current situation. It got shot down by the Supreme State Supreme Court because what was on the ballot was not only different from what was passed by the legislature. It, it was greatly different. Yeah, it didn't accurately 
inform the voters of what they were voting on, which is what's required right. for and a constitutional yeah, amendment. Yeah, and go ahead. I looked at a couple of the, of the bills that created the constitutional amendments that are on the ballot now, and the way it is, they have a description of the new language in the Constitution with the usual kind of legislative markup with bold new language and strike through old language and like that. And then at the end, the very last section of the bill says what the language is that's going on the ballot for people to vote on it. You're right. And the requirement is that that, vote, that language on the ballot has to accurately inform the voter of what the changes are they're voting on. Yeah, that just And that's sense. what wasn't yeah. satisfied yeah, it was in not only previous. Yeah, but it wasn't a nuance that you know caused the conflict. It, this is a tremendous difference between allowing convicted felons to qualify for public office as soon as they you know finish their probation, or or wait 15 years before they can. That's that's quite a difference. I don't see how anybody could have overlooked that. But anyway, um, and I don't see why we punish felons any longer once they've finished their original sentence and paid their fines and whatnot. So I I would have to say that um, leave things as they are, allow them to qualify for public office so long as they're not under an order of imprisonment. Yeah, well, you can run for the U.S. Senate or the U.S. House even if you're in prison at the time you're on the ballot. That happened back uh, in 1798. Matthew Lyon ran for Congress while he was in prison, and he won the election. Wow. Yeah, now, what's his name? De Silvia, um, the Brazil president that is in jail right now, he's running for president again. But they have a, a, a constitutional provision that prevents him, but he's running anyway. But Yeah, well, he ended up, he ended up the the Supreme Court down there threw him off the ballot, and so it was like the next okay. in line that actually appeared on the ballot and came in second. There's going to be a runoff. Right. Okay, so that's that's amendment number one um, that would place restrictions, greater restrictions on felons for qualifying for public office. And, of course, the um, opposition to or the support for the amendment comes from people who say, well, if you're a convicted felon, you're not willing to obey our laws, so how can we count on you to, you know, pass our laws? But I think any reasonable per per person knows that all of us, most of us, a lot, fail, of, us. A lot of us, <laughs> fail to obey all the laws. It's just a question of severity, and it's, it isn't always just a disregard for the law. It could be a moment of passion, desperation, or whatever. You it's know. also a question of who gets caught. And who gets caught, right, and who can afford to you know, get pardoned yeah. or whatever. Or I think perhaps more helpful to the voters than prohibiting someone being on the ballot because of having been convicted would be to have the voters fully informed of what the history and background of the candidates are. Right. And, and a lot more could be done in that regard exactly. that isn't being done. Uh, and and debate things like requiring expo uh, release of their tax returns. Right. Imagine that. Yeah. You know. And um, there are laws that many people don't agree with. That if we didn't, if we still allowed jury nullification, they would refuse to convict somebody on. So if they, if if it's the case where somebody was convicted of say, selling weed to their friends to support their own use of weed. Um, a lot of people might say, well, so what's the big deal? You know, he wasn't hurting anybody, so why sh why shouldn't we elect him, even if he's got this felony conviction for, you know, getting caught three times or whatever? Leave it up to the voters. Yeah, leave it up to, to the voters. To be fully yeah. informed and make the decision. Yeah, we either have the... No, never mind. Anyway, um, Amendment 2, I, um, Professor Angela Bell and I discussed at length last week for it requires unanimous juries for felony cases. Um, and there's an issue, of course, the current law that allows, well, originally it was it allows nine out of 12 jurors to convict uh, a person of a felony and put them up for hard labor, but then it was changed in 1974 to require 10, at least 10 jury, jurors. Well, originally it required unanimous verdicts. Right. It became a state in 1812. Yeah, but in 18... In 18, yeah, in 1812. But in Louisiana 18, purchased in 1803 and became a state in 1812, and the Constitution required unanimous verdicts right on up until 1898, 1898 when yeah. 
they said, well, 9 out of 12 is good enough, and then later they reduced that to 10 out and of 12. And it was stated by the men, in, or at least a couple of the men in that convention, at the end they said their whole reason behind this was to preserve the supremacy of white males. I mean, that was the stated reason for putting this um, change in to allow non-unanimous juries. And, of course, it paid off later on when the federal government started requiring black voters or black people on juries that tried black, you know, black defendants. defendants thank you. And um, so they could say, okay, we'll put two on there and just ignore whatever they have to say. And that's, that's basically what has gone on. So... And there's another another aspect I heard someone discussing this uh, mention that when you have a require a unanimous verdict, it encourages discussion during the jury deliberations about uh, interpreting the evidence. And some jurors may have noticed things others didn't, and it comes out in the discussion, and jurors get persuaded. But if you only require ten, in the initial polling that takes place when they go into the jury room. Those two who have their doubts may not ever get a chance to, to even have that it. discussion right. and present their perspective because ten of the twelve had already made up their mind. And if it's if it's the black people who dissent, who happen to be from the same neighborhood ever and, and truly are peers of the uh, accused, they their side should be heard. It's, it's likely they might have a different perspective than middle class white jurors who don't understand a lot of the uh, intricacies of the case because they're not from that culture, from that place. So it, it, I think there was that, that requiring the input like that from the uh, all the jurors would, would be beneficial. I agree. So, yeah, I'm for this one, obviously. Um, unanimous juries for felony cases, Amendment 2. Amendment 3 would allow local governments to share resources. Um, Right now, the state constitution prohibits donations or loans by state or local government entities, except in cases of emergencies. The law, the Louisiana law, Supreme Court has recognized that governmental entities may make agreements to share with each other, but has ruled that this authority does not relieve entities of the requirement to receive at least equivalent value in exchange for the services or assets provided. And that sounds fair to me, um, leaving it as it is, is what I'm saying. Um, Because I I guess what they're trying to do is um, allow local governments or political subdivisions to donate equipment and personnel, just donate it to another government um, just to be nice. And the taxpayers, of course, have to pay for the maintenance costs on equipment and the salaries and everything else. And I don't see any reason why it shouldn't stay as, as it is where the government's using another government's equipment or people should pay a rent or something. Yeah, it seems reasonable to me that because, like you say, the taxpayers of the donating government entity are going to be carrying that cost and the benefits going to taxpayers somewhere else. They give an example in the argument for about a bulldozer. Yeah. You know, for example, if a fire district needs to borrow a bulldozer from a city, it can save the cost of purchasing a bulldozer. Well, it can also save the cost by renting the bulldozer at a fair rental value. At a fair, right, a fair, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, so, yeah, that sounds like a bogus argument there for that one, and I agree with you, Lang. I I don't think, and I I agree with the opponents of it. Uh, Amendment 3, I would say, um, is not needed, which is one of the arguments, because they're already exchanging services and equipment and personnel under some kind of compensational you know agreement they they can do it that way the reason that was given for proposing this amendment is because they aren't doing that in some cases and so they want to the make it legal to let them do it yeah the legislative auditor raised a question about this might not be kosher this not might, oh. might not be legal uh, what you're doing here, just giving away the use of your equipment and the time, the labor time of your personnel that you're providing to operate this equipment to the yeah. other government entity. And so, well, instead of trying to address the issue with, that was raised by entering into a proper agreement for compensation to be paid, they said, well, let's just get rid of the rule. Get, yeah, get rid of the restriction. Yeah, funny how that works, huh? So, yeah, I, I would say I would recommend that I am going to vote no on um, allowing local governments to just freely share my stuff 
you know, my taxpayer funded stuff with other other governments for whatever reason that they think is is necessary. There should be some review there, I think, and some compensation. Anyway, listen to Lang Baker and Wayne Parker here on a pause for thought on Baton Rouge Community Radio. We're discussing the upcoming proposed amendments for November 6th ballot and one proposed legislative, one act, I guess. Uh, 343-9927, 343-9927, give us a call if you'd like to provide some input or perspectives on any of these topics. And we should perhaps interject that the opinions we're expressing here aren't necessarily those of the station or anyone in the operation of the station. We're just two guys beating their gums, <laughs> engaging in intellectual flopping about, I guess, yes. but That sounds about right. Yeah. And that's good, Lang. See, I told you last night that you're a, you're a half of this show. This is our show, not yours, because I, as the official host, should have thought of that. So I'm glad you I'm clarified that. I'm happy to be a sidekick. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I just recognize that I, I recognize that you make an equal, if more than, you know, a better con- contribution. Anyhow, Amendment number four to the state constitution um, concerns diverting money from the transportation trust fund to pay for traffic control, pay the state police to engage in traffic control. And the, the proposed amendment would remove the state police for traffic control purposes from the allowed uses of money in the transportation trust fund so they wouldn't be allowed to, any longer to divert money from the trust fund to the state police um, for the purpose of traffic control and i guess that's because well from what they're saying here it's been used quite a bit to pay for state police uh, expenditures that would were expected to be paid for from the general fund, but there wasn't money left in the general fund for it because they diverted that to somewhere else, probably. Or cut the taxes. Or cut the taxes, right. Um, and so they're just using the Transportation Trust Fund for anything. They were using it to plug the holes in what previously had been general funds right. to cover. Um, and... I don't. I wasn't around to follow what the debate was and the pros and cons of whether this was actually a legitimate uh, use of the transportation trust fund monies. The Constitution does allow up to 20 percent of that fund to be used for certain alternative purposes, which includes uh, for state police traffic control purposes. But just exactly what traffic control purposes is and how how uh, elastic that concept is to where we can stretch it out and say well everything they're doing driving up and down the highways of the state is traffic control purposes because they're looking for speeders or whatever or whether it is supposed to be more restrictive like traffic control around construction sites you know I don't know whether there was a, a, a legitimate discussion of the proper interpretation of that constitutional right. clause that permitted it been and used it, that way, but we know from what they're reporting that the diversion was to fill holes left because of the reduction of general uh, general funds right. monies. When they were going around looking in every place they could to find something to make up their shortfall. Yeah, yeah it, it seems to looked. me that they would have a budget ahead of time planned that would use authori- funds in the authorized amount from the trust fund to pay these expenses, but then later on say, "Uh uh-oh, you know, we don't have enough money over here, so we're going to divert general fund money into it and replace it with trust fund money, and that's that's clearly not authorized, I don't think, from the looks of it. And one thing to point out here, recently the legislature has cut back and then eliminated that repurposing of those funds so it would not have an Im- an immediate effect to place to remove this provision from the constitution and no longer allow that it would not have an immediate effect on the budgets of this yeah the because it, because they are now being funded from other sources so yeah and it says here that since 2016 this is the par um, guide 
since 2016, the legislature has not used the trust fund to support the state police. So, yeah, like you're saying, there, there would be no immediate budget impact. Uh, there might be one later on if the economy takes a downturn or whatever, but the state should be responsible enough to plan for that and have contingencies and not be allowed to just to play, raid, the, play to raid the, this fund yeah, which we need to for, play the shell game right for the great backlog of maintenance projects and new projects that we need for the transportation's yeah infrastructure of the state and they state here in the the guide that you know just about everybody agrees that Louisiana's roads and and infrastructure need need repairs and improvements you sure see it driving around town yep and they say here that greater than they got a greater than 14 billion dollar backlog of needs on existing surface roads and even more for other modes of transportation so yeah we can't afford to be giving all that money away so i would say uh definitely a no on amendment four and another another dimension of the de debate over this provision is that some of the arguments against the proposed increase in the gasoline tax was well it's not you aren't using all the transportation funds for that because you you're diverting it to these other purposes so why should we put more in right and so this in a way addresses that opposition to increasing the resources that go into this trust fund yeah and i think someone in here i think it was this amendment where an opponent opponent of um, or what someone who was in favor of the amendment I think it was says we should be reducing restrictions on spending state funds not increasing them and I thought who in the world would have stuck his face out and said that you know in public but um, anyway all right here's one that's kind of odd but it also has a similarity I think with the um, the first amendment in that um, a different bill was put out. Well, that's in number six. Oh, that's number six. Okay. Number five. We're going on to number five right now. Is um, establishes or extends tax exemptions for property in trust that people put in trust for planning or for estate planning purposes or whatever. Um, and there's some things here that I found I found that surprised me. This is, I guess, the, the new thing I learned this week, getting ready for this show, but. Property tax assessors, okay, they mentioned here first that we all get, our primary residences always already get $75,000 in exemption from uh, the value uh, to be taxed. But there are also property tax assessments are frozen and therefore will not increase for homestead owners who are over the age of 65, who are disabled veterans or the surviving spouses of members of the military who were killed in action or the totally disabled and disabled veterans or their surviving spouses will receive we already receive an additional seventy five thousand dollar property tax exemption and also a one hundred percent property tax exemption is available for homeowners who are the surviving spouse of a member of the military state police local law enforcement or a firefighter who died in the line of duty and what they're saying with this amendment is to allow people to put their property in a trust um and but still live in it but and not pay you know and still get exemptions for these things yeah, the exemptions would continue even after the property was placed, was in, placed a trust. in a trust right and i don't know i don't i don't see that we're already getting a lot of exemptions yeah you know. my question is who was advocating for this in the first place because it's not everybody who's going to go to an estate planner and get their property transferred into a trust for estate planning purposes, which is what was stated was the reason for this. And so my question is, why do we need this? Who is, who is going to benefit, benefit for this? And so I, I'm, yeah. I wouldn't vote for it just because I don't think there's a justification presented in clear enough language for, for me to see who's benefiting and why. Right. You've already got all the benefits if you fit into one of these categories. Right, and putting it's, it into a trust. I, so moving it into a trust, what, what, what's your motive for moving it into a trust? Yeah, that's, that's like I said before the show. I can't understand that because I've seen deeds when properties have been sold to children, say, by a parent. That, re that 
have a provision in them that although the children take over ownership of the house, the parents can live there until they die. So, and they and there are wills. People can specify who gets what in the will. So I don't understand the big deal with the trust unless they're looking for um, more exemptions that way. I don't know. You know, I don't know. But um, I would vote no on this one, and that's my opinion, of course. That's that's Amendment Five: tax exemptions for a property trust, which they would extend the exemptions to properties that are placed in a trust. And Amendment Number Six allows large tax increases on homes. Uh, and it states here that all property, the current situation is that all, pro, all property subject to taxation is constitutionally required to be reassessed at least every four years or when it's sold. Um, increases in assessments will result in the owners paying more property taxes. And let's see, so they want to, with this bill, it would require a four-year phase-in of the tax liability for homes subject to the homestead exemption when a reappraisal increases assessments by more than 50 percent. Um, and so, you know, if, if you if you a home and it was assessed last year for a val certain value, and then the next time around it's reassessed um, for more than 50 percent of the previous value, they they the state or the Either the tax collector or the tax assessor can phase in. I think it's the tax liability that, that can be phased in. So you'd only pay 25% of the taxes on the new value. And then the next year would go up by 25%, I think, it's been over four years. Yeah, that's roughly the way it works. We've got a problem here this year that was a problem with number one back when it passed before. And that's there's a conflict between the description of the proposed constitutional amendment that appears on the ballot and what the actual constitutional amendment is. Uh, and there's this this power report pointed out a couple of those uh and this is for number six yeah let's in the ballot that. language. And one of them is that the ballot language says that any reappraisal by more than 50 percent would be phased in over the four, four years. But the legislation the, says the reappraisal is not what's phased in over time. It would be listed by the assessor at the new fully assessed value. It's the tax liability that's going to be phased in. Okay. And the consequences of that, from my understanding, is that the taxing authority, for instance, the school district, is looking at the total appraised value in the district when it sets its millage rate. And if the total assessed value has gone up these larger amounts, but the tax liability hasn't gone up as much, then they're going to be getting less taxes from that total assessed value than the calculation for the millage rate, which would... would expect to produce. Right. And this this constitutional amendment also says that the school district in this case would have to absorb that loss of in, of revenue. They couldn't redistribute that over their entire tax base so that they would end up with the same amount of tax revenue that they would have gotten if the assessed value is what was actually the basis for the taxes. Could they increase the millage? Well, that that would have appear to be in violation of this that says you can't shift that tax those last ta lost taxes to other taxpayers in your in your uh yeah but if you're if you're increasing the millage it would be increased on everybody would it not well it would be increasing it more on the people who didn't get this phase in than on the well uh, presumably so, they didn't presumably they didn't get a reassessment that increased their property value though yeah, well, maybe this is going to that would have to go to court to figure it out. But it appears to me on the surface that it says that the intent is that you're not going to end up getting more taxes from other taxpayers to make up from what you've lost from these taxpayers that have gotten the phase in. Yeah, and it also says too that the exempt or the um, phase in would not apply to increases of property value that were created by you building on the property or, or you know making improvements. It would only be for situations where your property value went up through no action of your own, like the property values around you went up, and that's going to drive up your values. Well, supposedly. I mean, we can say that there are 
on a, a variety of reasons why the assessment may go up. And this just says that in those two particular situations where it's because of new construction or improvements. It can't. Then it can't. But for all the other reasons, it, it can. And we might, might not be foreseeing what those other reasons are. For instance, if it had been uh, inaccurately undervalued in the past, and you're just trying to make up for mistakes of the past by bringing it up to what it should have been all along. Right. And um, I don't know. I kind of was thinking, too, that why not allow it on a case-by-case basis where people would, you know, if they're, if they're being hurt by the new assessment, they could apply for these phase-ins, and it could be evaluated by an appropriate authority or whatever. Well, I would think rather than phasing in the tax liability that they would have could have a deferred payment plan so that they would make that lost revenue up and pay interest down the on road. it yeah no that that sounds like okay we're, so, well in any case um, we're out of time lang but uh, so we didn't get to the law which would um, allow parish residents to forbid or allow um, fantasy sports contests to be betted on legally in their parish, but we can't get to that. Um, I guess that's it, Lang. Actually, I'm over time right now, and I'll take this one. It's not your fault, even though you're an equal partner here. Uh, you've been listening to Wayne Parker and Lang Becker. We've been kicking around the constitutional amendments, proposed amendments to the state constitution that will be on the ballot in November of this year, on November 6th. But uh, that's it. We thank you for listening. we got to go. You have a good night.